Solving the heat or diffusion equation u sub t equal d u x x. This video is part one, finding the general solution. So in order to solve the um, heat or diffusion equation, we're going to take advantage of some things that we learned from the vector differential equation x prime equal a x. Remember there that the solution, the general solution consisted of a sum of terms that had the following structure an arbitrary constant multiplied by e to the lambda t, where lambda was an eigenvalue of the matrix A, and then multiplied by the associated eigenvector V. And we added up those terms, that gave us the general solution. So here we're gonna do something similar, except now the sum is going to be a little bit different. Instead of adding up vectors, we're gonna be adding up functions. So here's the arbitrary constants, and now we have an infinite sum of these. And that arbitrary constant is going to multiply e to the lambda t again, where this is an eigenvalue now of a derivative operator instead of a matrix operator. And then finally, instead of vectors, we have eigenfunctions that we're going to be adding up. So separation of variables is the technique that we're going to use to formalize this. And what we do with separation of variables is we assume that each of these individual solution pieces will be of the form a function of t multiplied by a function of x. So that's t of t and y of x. So we plug these into the differential equation u sub t equal du x x, and we get, uh, on the left-hand side, we get t prime, where that prime is the derivative with respect to t, times y, and on the right-hand side, we get d times t times y double prime. So we can equate those because the equation dictates that. So we get t prime y equal dt y double prime. And dividing through by y and then by t, we get the equation t prime over dt is equal to y double prime over y. Now this isn't a useful equation as is, but notice that this whole side here does not depend on x and this side does not depend on t. So if you have a function of t with no x and a function of x with no t that are equal, the only way that's possible is if they both are equal to some constant, and we'll call that constant beta. So now we can take this part equal to beta and separately this part and equate it to beta, and we get two equations, one for t, and another one for y. Now the one for t is quick to solve. This is just a constant b beta times d, so we know that it has the form t of t is equal to e to the beta dt. And now let's think about solving the y double prime equation. So to solve the equation y double prime equal beta y, we need to know the sign of beta. So let's assume for now that beta is positive. In that case, the solutions, uh, the general solution is a constant times e to the root beta x plus another constant times e to the minus root beta x. Now, it turns out these will not be particularly useful to us, so we don't really have to worry about these. But the more useful ones happen when beta is negative or when beta is equal to zero. So when beta is negative, we can put a negative sign in front of the beta, square root it, and one of the solutions will be sine of root minus beta x, and the other one will be cos of root minus beta x. And these will be very useful, and we're gonna to have to find different values of beta, and we're gonna add all of those different functions up with different betas in here and here. And that will be how we build our solution. Now, for some cases, um, this is the non-homogeneous boundary cases, as we'll see later, Beta equals zero is a case that is also actually useful. When beta equals zero, that exponential function for t just ends up being one, because remember, it was e to the beta dt, which simplifies down to one when beta is zero. Uh, and the corresponding y equation will then be steady states, because the t dependence has no t in it. So what we end up with when beta equals zero is the steady states. And the equation for y looks like y double prime equals zero. And that's always going to be solved by a straight line with some slope a and some intercept b. Okay, so 
this case will be useful for non-homogeneous boundary conditions. So we're gonna um, we can forget about that temporarily and focus on the beta negative case. So we're gonna find all the possible beta values that make these two useful solutions and add those up to construct our solution. And in some cases, the non-homogeneous boundary condition cases, will also include a term like this in our sum. Okay, so how do we choose these values of beta? It's the boundary conditions that tell us what values of beta are going to be used. And like I said before, the exponential ones will never really be that useful because of the types of um, boundary conditions we're going to be uh, dealing with. Okay, so determining what what are the sort of acceptable values of beta for our solution. Uh, so because the heat or diffusion equation has a single derivative in time, we're going to need one initial condition. And because it has two derivatives in space, we'll need two other conditions. And because these are space conditions, not time conditions, we call them two boundary conditions. And usually for something like the heat equation, diffusion equation, the conditions would each be at one end instead of being both at one end, like we had for second order functions, second order uh, differential equations in time. Okay, so there's two different types of boundary conditions that people talk about and use, and these come from sort of different modeling applications. One is if you ever want to specify the temperature at the ends of the rod or the concentration for the diffusion equation, or if you want to specify the flux. So if you're dealing with the actual concentration and setting that, say, equal to zero, then you would use Dirichlet conditions, and these would be called homogeneous Dirichlet conditions. And if you're using the derivative, which if you multiply by a minus d, it gives you the flux, then those conditions are called Neumann conditions. And these are the two that we'll discuss in uh, this course. Okay, so how do these boundary conditions dictate the value of beta? Well, the boundary conditions uh, need to be satisfied, and because they're zero, we want to make sure all the pieces satisfy these conditions. So uh, let's say we have Dirichlet, zero Dirichlet boundary conditions, it's like these ones here. So u is zero at both zero and at three for all time. Uh, so clearly the equation u at zero is zero is not satisfied by the cosine terms. So I'm not going to be able to include those. Or said another way, we will be forced to choose a n here in this sum of cosines to be zero. Otherwise, we fail to satisfy the boundary conditions. Similarly, the steady state when you have zero um, Dirichlet conditions is necessarily going to be a zero line. So that means we choose A equal B equal AN all equal to zero. And the only thing that we're left with in building our solution is a sum of these exponential times sine functions. Now we have to figure out what we can put in here. Uh, and so we use the other boundary condition, the one at three, to determine that. So u at 3 has to be equal to 0. So when we add up all of these, uh, these trig functions multiplied by exponentials, we want to make sure they're 0. Now the only way to do that is to ensure that the sine function evaluates to 0. And that means that 3 times minus square root of minus beta has to be a multiple of pi, where n can be 1, 2, 3, and so on for to infinity. So we can solve that for beta and we get beta values of minus n squared pi squared over 3 squared. And that means that our solution now is the sum from n equal 1 to infinity, 1 for each of these successful sine terms that satisfy the boundary conditions, some unknown function b or some unknown constants bn which we'll have to determine using the, the initial condition as we always do for those arbitrary constants. And then the eigenvalues are minus n squared pi squared d over 3 squared. Multiply that by t in the exponent. And then multiply that function by a function of x, which is sine of n pi x over 3. So now to figure out how to specify the bn, well, we appeal to the initial condition. 